So let's take a trip back in time. Let's go back to school. For some of you, that's a quick trip. For people like me, uh, <laughs> I might be back in 18 minutes, but um, I say that because I've just had my 45th school reunion. Um, I didn't go, I didn't go, because I can think of nothing worse than going to see people that I haven't seen for 45 years, and they tell me, you look different. Um, <laughs> but I want you to cast your mind back, all of you in the room, and think about school. I want you to think about teachers who made a difference. Because teachers do make a difference. They can be positive and they can be negative. Let me share three significant teachers from my youth. The first taught me ballet. And believe it or not, she's still alive. The queen gave her her 100th birthday card. She turns 102 this year. The second was my English teacher. And the third was my geography teacher. We won't talk about maths. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I learned the content. I can pirouette. I can write a poem and I can list the planets. In English, I learned the importance of structure. I learned my love for words and the power of communication. Geography taught me many things. The physical structure of the world, the big wide world, which I think is why I love to travel so much today. And ballet taught me discipline. It taught me determination, and it made me tenacious. But what do all of these have in common? The interesting thing is that the commonality has nothing to do with the content. They all allowed me to be creative, to imagine whether it was through the writings of C.S. Lewis in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, where they walked through the wardrobe into the land of Narnia, or The Wisdom of Churchill, or W.H. Auden's heartfelt expression of grief, or geomorphology from geography, which is the study of landforms what shapes them and what makes them change? Or being a swan in Swan Lake. Or learning about love and betrayal, life and death, vengeance and forgiveness in Giselle. Passion, creativity and imagination are what these teachers taught me. They allowed me to develop um, a, an individual passion for life. Yes, I passed all the subjects, but there's a very big difference between passing and knowing. And these became the base for my entrepreneurial endeavors. And yes, I'm a professor, but I've paid my school fees uh, <laughs> in entrepreneurship. I've failed, I've failed fast, <laughs> and I've failed forward. So, this passion and imagination and creativity are still part of me decades later in my current world. But what does that world look like? What is the world of business and business education, specifically entrepreneurship and innovation, look like? A lot of speakers today have spoken about how are we getting things wrong with disruption? Um, how we can um, influence people in terms of their future lives? But let me give you the context of the world within which I work. And these are quotes. Innovation is embedded across the legislative, policy and strategic frameworks for South Africa's economic and social development domains. 
However, its ability to translate into significant changes to the country's economic and social priorities remains relatively slow. This is a quote from this year. So we've got all the stuff, we've got the policies, but we don't seem to be able to get that into action. Unemployment or employment by SMMEs accounted for 28% of formal jobs. Internationally, SMMEs should contribute 60 to 70% to an economy. We have an abundance of necessity entrepreneurs. We have an abundance of people who are just trying to earn a living by selling vegetables or cutting people's hair. They're not contributing to the economy and they're also not contributing to their self-esteem. If we have a look at unemployment, and I don't have to share this, I think we're all aware, our unemployment rate sits at 34.7%. My family live in California, and they wobble when they get to like 3% unemployment. And I say, come here, this is where the real stuff is happening. The other area of my life, so that's the context of the industry. But I work in education. And education, in my opinion, has become commodified. So we have a market-infused approach to education regarding knowledge as a commodity rather than a knowing, and school as a marketplace where knowledge is exchanged based on monetized value. So I'm not finding children coming through to the business school who know about the imagination that I learned, who know about the stories about their families or their traditions, because stories transport you into a world of what if, a world of possibility. And then we bring them into a commodified world of education where it's supposedly my job to get them out. To get them out with what? That's one of the big questions that I ask myself all the time. Abraham, similar to me, is a lecturer at the Indian Business School. And in 2012, he did some research um, on the bottom of the pyramid, which is the area where I work as well. I'm busy launching a big project on entrepreneurship for the disadvantaged, looking at them in terms of not how many they are, but what is it that we can do to enable, whether it be from a sexual orientation, an economic orientation, a physical handicapped orientation, or a location orientation. But in his research in India, he classified three types of entrepreneurs. The vegetable seller on the roadside, the SMME, small business owner, and then the Bill Gates, the Elon Musks of the world. And he says, and this I really agree with, he says entrepreneurship is a hyper-specialized skill. It is a skill set that only a fraction of the population possess. If I were to look at the average MBA class, and I've done this myself in class, less than 5% become entrepreneurs. The rest are looking for jobs. So we live in a world where the idea of entrepreneurship has become a solution to all the world's problems. And this often involves an oversimplification of these problems, a quick fix. You know, you can't get a job, go and be an entrepreneur. Um, it's like me saying to you, um, go and play the piano for a living. Um, which is not an easy task. So I don't know how we've managed to get to this level um, of entrepreneurship. So I ask the question, are we doing the right thing or are we doing things right? What do I mean by that? And I know it's bad English. Uh, <laughs> 
doing the right thing means that we're doing the right thing at the wrong time. While doing things right means we're doing things at the right time or place. So I've been in this world for the last 17 years. Um, I do come from commerce. As, a, as uh, I said, I am an entrepreneur. But I asked myself the question which I asked you about the teachers who made a difference in your life. And I thought to myself, lecturers should make a difference too. But how? How am I going to make that difference? So I asked this big question, what if? And my first what if was, what if I change the way I teach? What if I throw out the theoretical, traditional one, two, three, let's learn about the history of entrepreneurship? Why? You know, let's learn about this. I asked myself why. So I challenged that, and I challenged that on the basis that I do believe that our traditional teaching of entrepreneurship is dulling innovation. It's dulling entrepreneurship. And so I revisited my curriculum, and I thought, what should I throw in here? Um, and being a fairly creative person, um, I do a lot of happiness. I do a lot of things about self-esteem. I do a whole module on how to be curious. Let's be curious and let's ask why. How can we become entrepreneurially alert so that we see things that happen in our environment? So that I have people who pass and know. And that, for me, is very important. So what is knowing? How do I define that? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary says, it's shrewdly and keenly alert. It indicates a possession of exclusive inside knowledge and information. So it comes from within. It's from self. Now, how do I teach that? How do I teach what my ballet teacher taught me? How do I get that into a student? Um, and what am I going to do about that? So I question my curriculum. I question my mode of delivery. We have an incredible amount of fun. We tie each other up with string. We build the traditional macaroni um, tower to teach assumptions. And then I asked myself, what if I started looking at my students through a different lens? What about if I challenged my assumptions? I look at all of you. You could be in my class. What do I know about you? What is it about you that makes you unique? Because I can't make you passionate unless I know what button to push. So your uniqueness is something that I have to try and find out from my students. I deal with students of varied disciplines. I have engineers, I have accountants, I have pharmacists, I have lawyers, and many, many more. They're all different, and they all come with a different mindset. I've learned that engineers think very differently to accountants. Um, it's just a completely different way of thinking because of the way that they were taught. They come from different backgrounds, totally different, as all of us speakers here today, completely different backgrounds. So what is it about their background that I need to understand so that they can get through the stuff to get to the passion? And so I spend a lot of time on that, and in that I apply design thinking in terms of being customer-centric towards my student. What if I made them look at themselves differently? And I do this through an assignment, which is a very deep personal reflection, where I achieve my previous what if, because they tell me everything about themselves. They tell me about their grandparents that were entrepreneurs, or they tell me about their aspirations. They tell me about their fears. 
they tell me about their lack of self-esteem, the lack of efficacy, um, and the things that they don't have, which we need if we're going to build entrepreneurs. What if I changed or challenged the way that they think? Because I must be honest, for some students, it's a brand new experience. <laughs> um, and leaning on John Maxwell, who's done an incredible amount of work in this area, I encourage them to try thinking for a change. So more often than not, I find that teachers teach people what to think instead of how to think. So we've got to open ourselves to be challenged. Let's have an argument. Let's have a debate and see what comes out of it. So I spend a lot of time on the types of thinking, strategic, focused, possibility, creative, because thinking will expand your options. It will enable opportunity spotting. Um, and it should become a good habit because it will to help you look at the world through different eyes. The most important style of thinking for me is liminal thinking, which um, if you read David Gray's book, it's about creating the change you want by changing the way that you think. Liminal thinking, and a liminal is a threshold, is the art of creating change by understanding, shaping, and reframing your belief. It's about getting in touch with your ignorance. It's about seeking understanding, and it's about doing something different. So I use a lot of liminal thinking. Then what if I changed their role and their contribution to society? What if I made them job creators rather than job seekers? What if I even made them just think about that concept? What if I made them enablers in the entrepreneurial ecosystem? They might be running a bit corporate, but they need to be that enabler in that environment, which I would call an entrepreneur. So would this make my lecturing different? Um, I'm going to close with a couple of quotes from my students. The one student says, the inward-looking aspects of the subject was a different, was a differentiator. It sets this module miles ahead of entrepreneurship modules from other universities. The subject was really one of my MBA highlights. She stimulated my creative ability and encouraged me to think independently. My attitude towards entrepreneurship is more aggressive now, with more drive and ambition to look for innovative ideas and opportunities. I have surely learned a great deal from the interactions in your sessions, and I thank you for sharing your knowledge, your passion, and making a difference. The approach is fantastic. I think Prof Cullen has hit the nail on the head with her approach. So I leave you with this thought and challenge. Nothing changes unless, nothing changes if nothing changes. So do something different and we hopefully will see a change. I thank you.